How's it going everybody? Thanks so much for tuning in to this video. If you have not yet subscribed to our channel, we want to invite you to do so. We would love to have your support. Now at the beginning of this video, if you heard that example, I was playing through a matchless chieftain, which is my favorite amp of all time, and I was plugged into this guy right here. This is a sewer reactive load IR. Now, what this does is it eliminates the need to mic up a speaker cabinet. Okay, so what it does is you plug, in, in my case, my physical tube amplifier into the back of the input jack where it says from amp. And then what it does is it has three outputs on the back. So you can t tell that there's the input and then there's three outputs. Now the first is just a through where you could still run to a speaker cap. Okay, so if you still wanted to have that as an option, you can do that. Uh, the other two, is uh, one of them is what's called the IR output, which is where it applies an impulse response from the input of your amp and then sends it out at line output, okay? So, or line level output. And then you can run that to your interface for your DAW or to you know, a DI box for front of house, whatever. Um, if you don't know what an impulse response is, <laughs> I encourage you to go look up a, um, you know, a definition probably more technical than what I'm about to say. So here's just a simple explanation is it is adding a simulation of a scenario where a, a mic is receiving information from a speaker cabinet. Okay. Cause basically with different IRs, you can set up different setups, different microphones, different speakers, different cabs, different rooms even. And it just allows you to change the, um, just like if you were to change cabinets or change microphones with your amp, it simulates that you can do those changes, but digitally, okay? So again, this is basically um, someone who wants to eliminate having to crank up an, uh, a cab and it be super loud and having to mic it up. Let's say you have a small space and you can't be super loud, or let's say you don't even have access to some great microphones or cabinets. This is a great solution for you. Now, there's also an output on here where it just says unfiltered, and that way you don't have to apply an impulse response. It just takes the input of your amp or the output of your amp and then just sends it unfiltered, uncolored um, at line level. Um, so for the video today, I don't want to necessarily go into some deep review of this piece of gear. If you want to do that, there are other videos there. What I want to talk about is basically a conversation of what is the future of the digital and modeling world? Like, are we going to see more pieces of gear like this that kind of marry but between the analog and the digital world? Are we going to continue to see new things on the market like the, uh, you know, multi effects type boards, more profilers, you know, um, leave a comment below. What do you think is going to happen in the market today? And to just kind of expand this conversation, I want to invite my friend Chad Borkwin into the conversation. So we're going to move over to a Zoom call that we had a few days ago, and let's check this out. Hope you enjoy it. All right. What's up, Chad? Hey, man. Thanks for having me on here, Aaron. Yeah, thanks so much for doing this. Yeah. I'm excited. Uh, Chad, go ahead and introduce yourself for those of you that may not know you. Sure. Yeah, uh, Chad Borquin from here in Kansas City, and I am the guitar player for Big Time Grain Company. I also own an entertainment agency. And then uh, my brother, Brett, and I, you know, we've got all kinds of projects that involve music licensing and training programs for other artists. Uh, we've got something called a Dream Big series, which is a keynote concerts for corporations and schools. And yeah, there's just, there's a lot going on. So. Cool. You staying busy during this time? Well, I am, you know, as we were talking about offline here, it's, it's, this is taking our, everything involved with live music and put it off to the side for a bit. So we're focusing on anything that's online, which is, you know, we'd already started, but it's, it's getting much needed attention because of this time. Mm. So yeah, it's been cool. good. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and dive in here. So we are talking about kind of the marriage between analog and digital today so we'll kind of stray away from the whole debate which is better which sound you know i think we can all agree that different scenarios you know any of them can sound good you know like if you know what you're doing you can make the analog sound good you can make the digital sound good and it just really depends on 
what atmosphere, what you're going for, what scenario you're in, what your budget is. So we'll kind of stray away from that debate, which one's better. But I do want to ask you, Chad, first of all, what gear are you using right now? I know when I've seen you play live, I've seen you use, you know, like actual tube amp stuff. And I know you have some modeling stuff. Go ahead and walk us through what you're actually using right now. Yeah, for live, I, my rig's been pretty pretty much the same for a while now. It's a Dr. Z uh, Maz 18. Um, and then also I've got a Vox AC 15 that I run stereo out of my pedal board. Um, I'm running those amps pretty, pretty clean, not much overdrive and getting all my, you know, overdrive and, and, and effects and course and everything compression out of the pedal board. That's live. Um, up till, Oh, and you actually had a big influence on me with the Kemper. I yeah. came and messed around with yours and whatnot. But um, uh, I used to record I always thought that same gear as well. Yeah. But uh, the Kemper, you know, when I added that into my, you know, it's sitting right here. I'm looking at it as I'm talking to you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, for me, the Kemper has opened up a huge palette of colors um you know we're doing a lot of instrumental things as well as our country group and the you know these that's about half the guitars i use the other half are on this wall <laughs> uh and i and the reason is the they all sound different they all have their own color their own thing and so you know as we're creating all these different styles and genres of songs for this you know having the ability to go anywhere. I mean, if there was one problem, I have too many options. Right. Um, and they all sound good, you know, well, yeah. I, I would say all <laughs> sound good, but I mean, but the ones that I've moved into my like local library right. for my main ones, they're there because they all sound good. And right. there's still a ton right. of options there. So yeah, I've gone on the exchange a few times, Yeah, you know, looking for a, a particular amp and I'll download it and I'll be like, oh man, this is horrible. Yeah, you know, like where right. where did they profile this amp at? Like, you know? <laughs> so yeah. what are some of the profiles that you've kind of? Are they just random, like from all different people, or is there a particular person or studio that you've found makes really good stuff? So yeah, um, the there's a guy named Jim Lill, and for the especially for the country stuff, Jim Lill has his own you know kind of video cast YouTube thing. And he went through and did 45 uh, profiles of two different amps. And so, and what he did is the different gain stages for each amp. And one was a Dr. Z amp. Um, I can't remember which one. And then the other one was the car amp. Okay. Uh, and then he's got, he, he profiled them with a 57, a fathead, and then so that he could re go run back through and reamp with two different mics on the same thing. And then, he, or, and then he had, and at that same gain stage, he did a combination of the two for live. Gotcha. That's cool. So it's very similar to my live, his mix of those two amps is very similar to what my live sound is. Gotcha. Um, so I use those a ton. And okay. then, um, but also Dr. Z's got a package that they sell. So I've, yeah. I've got that. I, I have one of the first one that they came out with. Yeah. I, I I jumped on it and it's been great. I've I've used it a lot. Uh, Michael Britt, you know, uh, he's got a ton of cool stuff, and mm -hmm. I've used his some of his heavier tones. Yeah, um, I've I actually <laughs> I've used your the four you sent me that you put oh, yeah. together for impact. Yeah. yeah, you know, I've used those a lot because you've got a cool like U two ish one and a yeah. swell one, and so for the for the I use like, yours a lot for the color. Yeah, I mean your solo one that you have. Yeah, that solo one with that pink guitar back there is <laughs> '80s all the way. When Dude, you I tell you what, those two things together. <laughs> the reason why is because it's a it's a fuzz pedal, like a vintage fuzz that I attached on there. <laughs> I really wanted that like Eric Johnson kind of sound, you know? Yeah, but like not, you know, where it's a little darker than like you normally would on like mm -hmm. something like a because it's a matchless amp. Yeah, which tends to be brighter like an AC30, but I wanted it to be a little little of the hair rolled off a little bit, you know, so yeah, but yeah, I, I like that patch too, so. So, and then like if I need a little more hair I, on that, it, 
I've just crank up the gain a little bit. I know you have to be careful with that some, yeah. <laughs> so you don't, but uh, like the last thing I just did, I did this one, we were working on this, this deal for a, a film type thing. And there's like, it's like only one bar of a solo. I yeah. to totally stole it from uh, Jessica Jones intro. <laughs> Cause they nice. just like, there's this like rip and solo. That's one bar and that's it. You know, that's like, great. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. And it was that sound I used with a little bit of a gain on yeah. it. Yeah. That guitar. <laughs> well, cool, man. Well, Hey, I'm going to kind of lead into a question and you may have even already answered this, but like, when do you find yourself choosing the analog over the digital and why? I know you said live, you use more of the analog amp and it mm -hmm. sounds like more in the studio, you're using the Kemper, some more of the digital stuff. Um, why, why don't you just use the Kemper all the time? Rather, or, you know, kind of kind of walk me through why you decide to differentiate between the two. Well, I still, and I know you can get this with speakers and stuff live, but I still like the air pushing behind my... Right, yeah. You know, I like the feel. Feels good. Yeah, it feels good. <laughs> um, but some of it's logistics. You know, um, the amps are all cased up in a trailer that's already mm. packed and ready to go. Um, but the Kemper and, and Kemper sitting here all the time. The only time I pull the Kemper out live right now is, is if I don't want to go grab an amp out of the trailer and want like right. I'm doing a fill in. Like so I, I use the Kemper at church um, sometimes. We, I used it on a TV interview. Okay. Um, and, uh, it's so good to just plug and play on with an engineer that may have never mixed for you before. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know? Totally. And, and that's, that's the big thing. So Brett does all our mixing, but that was the big thing he noticed when I started recording with the Kemper yeah. using almost a very similar sounds to what I was using with the amp, mm -hmm. he was getting way better out of the box stuff that we, he was having to do very little right uh, eqing to yeah because there's so much you know you don't have to sit there and and every time you want to record something make sure the mic's exactly in the right spot you know yeah. and then of course I'm, I'm doing this at home you know right so i don't have to run at a volume oh yeah right you know and i can record all day long and not bug anybody in the house right so yeah. And I just don't have to carry as much anymore. <laughs> That's what, right. The way the things I've figured out a system for me that keeps me from carrying as much. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, I definitely think that is an advantage for us at our church. We run two Kempers mm -hmm. and um, I have a matchless chieftain, which is my favorite amp of all time. Um, but the Kempers are so easy, you know, and we just, for our setup, like isolating a cab and micing it is just not yeah. an option. Like, right. um, we don't have, we have a large stage and our room is a decent size, but if I were to crank it up where I wanted to, even if I tried to build an ISO box, it's going to still be too loud. You know, we've tried that and you can still hear it, <laughs> but, um, and then we don't have much green room space back behind you know off the side of the stage because we then have classrooms off to the side that can still hear you know the amp cranked even when it's high. so for us the Kemper is like the you know or just modeling essentially is the the perfect setup for us and consistency sake right. I make everyone use pretty much two or three patches that we have loaded on so yeah that's a big advantage for us um so, you know, someone that has used analog for years and then has kind of also entered into the modeling digital world, what do you think? So we kind of know the different scenarios where they're, what they're good for and, mm -hmm. um, and that they sound great, you know, but what do you think the future is for this technology of modeling? Like, do you think we're going to continue to see things like the Helix, more of the multi-effects boards? come out we even saw Kemper come out with its own version the stage um do you think yeah. we're going to see more plugins I think we're going to see more of the you know the cool thing about the Kemper when it came out was that you could profile your own amp um there are some other ones that are coming out that are kind of like well where do you think we're going with this <laughs> well I can I can only kind of think of what 
would make things easier for like where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do a ton of fly dates, but we do do some. Yeah. And, you know, right now, I mean, I have the rack mount. I don't have, have the, the stage. Right. But even the stage, you know, you're getting on a plane with that. You know, it's a little, it's, it's decent size. I think we're going to start seeing options that are smaller. Right. More transportable. Um, I mean, it might go as far as to eventually people start carrying a, like you would think of a keyboard controller, but it's a pedal right. board yeah. where people just, it's, it's a generic pedal board <laughs> yeah. and, and you bring your flash drive. Oh yeah. You yeah. know, like the Behringer is, you know, kind yeah. of where you just show up with a flash drive and you plug it into <laughs> the generic. I mean, that, that would be a cool. Yeah. I mean, that may not have been thought about yet. That's a great idea for somebody. But um, and, I, and I did that with the Kemper because <laughs> the Kemper, you can, if you have, you know, like I flew to a friend's church in California and I brought mm. my Kemper rig on a USB drive. They had one. I popped it in and I was ready to go, you know, so yeah. like that is an awesome option, you know, and we I, I agree with you about the size thing, because like we've even seen the HX stop which is, you know, the tiny miniature version of the Helix. Yeah. And those things sound great. You know, they, they, they're easy to operate, you know? Um, so yeah, size is definitely a thing. Um, it would be cool. Like you said, if there was something that would be more universal that, you know, that would be become more almost industry standard, you know? Yeah. Kemper has kind of approached that, I think, you know, have they? Um, I mean, I think there, we see those more on professional stage than a Helix or even an Axe FX. Maybe I'm wrong, but from, from just viewing stages, like I even watched Hans Zimmer's live in Prague the other day, which is an awesome thing on Netflix, if you haven't seen it. Um, and they have, I mean, probably like eight Kempers on stage. Like wow. all the guitar players, all the bass players, everyone on there is using a Kemper, which I thought was awesome. Um, even people that I thought were die hard, like something else I've seen use Kemper. I'm like, okay, you know? Yeah. Um, so not to just ramp up Kemper because I have one, <laughs> but um, again, that is, I think a cool thing because you can just bring your USB drive, plug it in and you're ready to go. So uh, you may be able to do that with, a helix i don't have one so i don't know but um so yeah i i think size and maybe more industry standard would be cool you know yeah um so let's kind of dive in at, at the beginning before we start our zoom call i did a demo of me playing the sewer reactive load ir so um which is similar to the universal audio ox box you okay. know which essentially you can take an analog or solid state, even a tube amp, whichever, you know, actual physical amp, plug it in. I guess it essentially attenuates it as well, but it also applies an impulse response, you know, modeling a speaker cab and a microphone or even two microphones and then sending it out at line level so that you can either run live to a PA or you can run into your interface. So essentially, you know, you're turning your actual physical amp into kind of a direct Kemper modeling scenario, right? Kind of solution. Mm -hmm. um, would you find something like that helpful? Because you've said that the, the advantage of the Kemper is the size and not having to pull a amp off the trailer off the rig or whatever do you, would you find something like that helpful to where you could still use your amps but then again you don't have to worry about miking like you said moving microphones worrying about volume or anything like that well yeah for sure i mean i'm thinking especially for just personally the live scenario you know since i still like using my amps live you know removing yeah. the I mean, consistency is everything, right? You know, and if if the consistency of tone coming from that, you know, once it leaves the amp, is is the same quality or better of a mic, but yet it's going to be the same every time, 
right. I think that would be really, really helpful. Yeah, because the cool thing about the uh, reactive load IR and some of the other things that are implementing this technology is you plug your head into it. Mm-hmm. You can send out the IR filtered signal, but you can also still run into your cab. So for this scenario, you could still have the, you know, the mm-hmm. volume of air moving behind you, but the signal sending to the PA could always be the exact same thing, you know, mm-hmm. using that IR technology and you would never have to worry about microphones or anything like that. Um, so yeah, for, for someone that would want more of a consistency based, but also want that volume still, I yeah. think it's a great solution, you know? And, you know, I mean, I, as far as the amp, I would just have to, like in my studio, if I had one here, I just have to, I mean, it sounds like that's what you've done. And you, did you compare this with a mic? So I have not compared. The reason why is I feel like it would not be super beneficial because I don't have the same speakers and microphones that the um, sewer has built in. Oh. So what I could do, and maybe this is a future video, is make an impulse response um, of what I'm using and then load that impulse response into the sewer. So then you could actually compare. Um, so that could be a future video, but, um, as of right now, I don't have that set up. So, (laughs) but, um, the cool thing about this piece of equipment, you know, and the Oxbox, I suppose as well, the Oxbox has a little more features because you can have like an app and you can move around different microphones and stuff. This is very easy. You just plug it in, pick the profile that you have loaded in and then you, you go, um, but you can load in third-party IRs, which is cool. Hmm. Um, so I, I personally, I think it's really great for studio because I do like having a physical amp, just the whole tactile mindset um, and having the IR, you know, reactive load as a possibility to run straight in. I'm not having to mic up. You know, because again, essentially, I'm creating a model direct, almost Kemper version of my tube amp. Um, so I think that's a great technology, and I think we're going to see more of it arise. Um, yeah. Well, and the thing about tube amps is no tube amp sounds exactly the same. Right. You know, so if Dr. Z models their Maz 18, but the Maz 18 they modeled, I don't like as well as I like mine. Right. Then I can probably right. see how that. And, and I will say this about the Kemper is that it sounds the best if you have not messed with the EQ. Mm-hmm. So if you model an amp, however you have it set. So let's say, let's say I dimed every EQ knob and then I profiled it. When I pulled up that profile on the Kemper, even though I had all the EQs, at 10, they're gonna be at 12. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times that I find is someone will model an amp way too bright for me. And then I'll have to roll the presence and the treble down. And then you start, when you're messing with the EQ and the Kemper, you are coloring essentially what the natural amp is. So I try to find a Kemper profile that works for me EQ wise and gain wise Mm-hmm. without me having to do any adjustments yeah. and that's the cool thing is like if i if i had modeled my matchless super clean and i wanted it dirty without a pedal and i'm cranking that gain up on the kemper the, it, it might it may sound great but it may not sound the way the amp would have sounded if you would have actually turned the gain up so that's the only thing that i've noticed about the kemper is if i am doing a lot of tweaks yeah um it may not, it may still sound good and that's all that matters, but it may not be reflective of what the natural amp would have sounded like if I would have made that tweak on the actual physical preamp. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's my thing that I like about having the actual amp right in front of me because I do make a lot of different EQ changes if I'm tracking for it to fit in and to differentiate yeah. from the different parts and stuff. Um, so, 
I guess I also wanted to ask you this question, you know, for the future of, of modeling, um, let's talk about depreciation. And this is a big thing for me because, you know, and especially those who may be watching this channel, um, you know, church ministries and stuff like that, um, or someone that if they were to buy a Kemper, that's a huge investment, you know, like, for us as a church, I saved up for like two years to, to be able to buy our, I actually bought one Kemper, then I had to save up a whole other year and get another Kemper. You know what I mean? So they were huge investments on our end, right? Because mm -hmm. brand new without the powered version, they're 1800 bucks. You can buy a nice tube amp for 1800 bucks. Mm -hmm. So with the IR technology to where you can use a physical tube amp in the same scenario without having to mic a cab like you could a Kemper or any other modeling piece of equipment. Do you think it would be better on the long run to invest in an actual tube amp that may potentially hold its value longer than something like a Helix or a Kemper where maybe in even five years down the road becomes obsolete when they start coming out with new versions and then they stop providing firmware updates what what's what's kind of your opinion on that yeah I, it, that's kind of tough for me because i've never made a decision based on depreciation yeah um, i've made it based on what what do i need it out of this the most right um and somebody, I, I have a feeling I'm not answering your question, but somebody, somebody that is a one got basically, this is my tone. This right. is what I play with. This is what I love. The most out variances I'm going to want, I can do out of EQ or pedals. That's, you know, they're, they're probably the person that's going to really thrive on this whole amp deal because, you know, an amp probably will hold its value better. Yeah, for sure. You know, I don't, I don't really know. It's it, we're, we're in kind of some new times with this where somebody, you know, in recording, you know, a guitar, the more variance I do in tone, the bigger it sounds. Mm. And, and the more space you can create in a, in a guitar mix. Right. Using the same, you just can't do that with one amp. Right. You know, I mean, do you get a little bit with switching guitars, but it's going to be, it really takes mix and amps and that sort of thing to get that. So, so I, you know, if, if I'm making a decision on a depreciation, I would assume that the amps probably the safer bet. Right. Um, I'm guessing. Yeah. Cause you know, like I've always been a line six fan, like originally when the first little kidney bean pod, you remember the little burgundy yep. looking kidney <laughs> bean thing. When that came out, I jumped on it. Cause I thought that was awesome. You know? And then I bought the X3 then or the XT Live or whatever. Then I bought the HD 500. And at that point, you know, because they kept coming up with new models, I could hardly give away some of my older models. You know what I mean? Because they had, I think I paid five or 600 bucks for the HD 500 brand new, right? Yeah. And then eight years later, I was going to try to sell it. And I maybe sold it for like 90 bucks. You know what I mean? And again, for the years that I used it, it probably paid itself off. You know, maybe it's not, a, maybe I'm just overthinking this and it's not a big deal, you know, like it's worth what it was worth to you, you know, like, um, but again, I'm thinking of the person that mm -hmm. wants to buy something nice, you know, not just buy something cheaper and they want something that's going to last and may not have the option to buy multiple things. Well, I love, I love the versatility yeah. of the Kemper but I'm also thinking like, is it going to be obsolete in 10 years? You know what I mean? I mean, it could be, but what about you know, those pods? They, they, there weren't updates coming out. What, we get them like weekly now? Yeah. Weekly or every two weeks, there's an update coming out. You couldn't do that with a pod. Yeah. You know, this is what you get. Yeah. It's not changing, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Where the Kemper, it's like, it's there's constant improvements being made on that. Yeah. I mean, because it's essentially a computer, right? Right, yeah. You know, so I don't know. I don't know what would, 
I don't know what would make the internal guts of that obsolete. Right. Um, other than back to our discussion of size of more compact or more compact. Right. You know, maybe I don't, I mean, I don't know which yeah. they're doing with the right. stage and that stuff, but. And I think we can both agree. Like if it sounds good, it sounds good. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think that's the, that's the thing that people get hung up on, you know, like, Oh, I want to be the guy that comes in with the nice expensive amp and the gear mm -hmm. and look like I know what I'm doing. Um, I don't want to be the guy that has a little tiny pedal that my entire rig's on and come in and plug in and look like an amateur. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's still that stigma in the guitar world, unfortunately. Um, I mean, it's a real thing, but it's, it kind of stinks because what sounds good, sounds good, you know? Yeah. So it's like, I think the whole thing in this whole discussion, and maybe we didn't answer any questions. I don't know, but like, <laughs> we had but fun. The, the thing is like, <laughs> what works for you works for you. You know, you need yeah. to analyze and ask yourself what works best for my situation, what works best for my budget. Um, and again, if it works, it works, you know? Yeah. So, but Hey man, I had a lot of fun. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, talking gear. So yeah. Anytime, man. I always enjoy this. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So again, I appreciate it, man. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks so much for joining us today. Please leave a comment below. We would love to hear your opinions of where this market is going to go. And uh, again, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would love to have your support. Until next time, we'll see you later.